Okay, that wraps up session two, and uh, since we are on a tight schedule, we'll go right to session three. Se session three, we have uh, five presentations, and okay. four, of, okay, four of the five uh, uh, okay. recordings. Okay. So we'll go with the, according to the schedule, the first recorded presentation is by Professor Boychek. Sinaski, I hope I'm not really butchering his Polish name there. <laughs> uh, uh, if I find this response, uh, I my apologies. Uh, so, Professor Sinaski will uh, present the will we'll give a presentation entitled "Versatility and Creativity: Cases of Martial Art Masters." Hi, Ranking. Were analyzed. Okay. Gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, he is the editor of uh, Edo. Edo Movement for Culture. The subject of my lecture is versatility and Creativity cases of martial arts masters, masters, of course, selected masters. On the ground of the general theory of fighting arts, the problem was raised whether there is a correlation between the versatility coefficient A and the Creativity index among mass, martial arts masters. Our method, the cases of 22 martial arts masters of high ranking were analyzed. They are historical and contemporary figures. They but to the mastery was tested using the MQ scale and accepted indicators. The strict, strict descriptive statistics, uh, they are P square, P grammar and C person were used. scientific framework was co-created for the issues raised by the general theory of fighting arts and issues previously developed as part of the humanistic theory of martial arts and anthropology of martial arts. This applies among others to the concept of martial arts champion in combat sports, mastery in martial arts, Shugyo and positive asceticism. The long term training on the way to the mastery, the indicators of the mastery and the sense of traditionally awarded master degrees and titles were analyzed. Budo is a set of disciplines from the Japanese tradition of martial arts and combat sports. Psychological anthropogenesis is a concept whose understanding is different than in physical anthropology. This is about the development of an adept practicing this Japanese or other Far Eastern martial arts. You see the steps or stages in the way from an adept student to master and grandmaster of 10th degree. After my proposal that was published 20 years ago, proposal of the oral Budo development parameter, WB, when 
P is between 0 and 10. That was for 16 Udo disciplines. It seems reasonable to modify this pattern, reducing the number of disciplines to 10 by popularity criterion. Also, for IT Jitsu or Aikido, or Shin Jitsu or Self Defense, Yai, Judo, Jiu Jitsu, Karate, Ken Jitsu, Kobudo, Zendo as meditation practices, and other like Bo Jitsu, Ho Jitsu, Kyudo. The new coefficient would be A equals one tenth sum of alpha P for ten Buddha disciplines. Creativity criterion is for a new school or style C equals one when the international promotion and teaching in several countries C equals 2 and for the dissemination on a global scale so also the ability to be an indicator of creativity organizational C equals 3 Who is the grand master? Does it have its counterparts in the traditions and history of different countries, in myth and archetype? Is it not the equivalent of old wise men and saints? Is it a level of maturity in humanity? Does it characterize people who have achieved a high level of morality and wisdom? Warrior and sage archetypes occur in myths and legends which indicates their ancient source. From the earliest times, man was forced to show courage, bravery, take difficult challenges and make right decisions. The hero of many cultures is a victorious warrior. You see the evolution of the European archetype of the warrior from Mars through Achilles, a great hero and Saint Michael the Archangel to other Christian heroes. And in the second figure, the way from a young warrior to master and to the aristocrat of spirit, it is from the Znaniecki's terminology, the aristocrat of spirit, or homo creator nobilis. When does a warrior become a master or sage? Perhaps when he undertakes a deeper reflection on the meaning and purpose of his life path. He can then create some justification for his life choices. This kind of meditation prompted some of the outstanding experts to describe the principles of the path of the sword, or to choose the path to holiness, casus of Morikei Uyashiba about him below. You see, eight historical famous grandmasters and next part there are also grandmasters in alphabetical, in alphabetical order. Firstly, Miyamoto Musashi, our number one, actually Shimen Musashi no Kami Fujiwara no Genshin Miyamoto, son of Unisai Shinmen, was born in 1584 
and died in 1645. He was a master of Kenjitsu, but also a specialist in Jujitsu and Shuri Kenjitsu. Shortly before his death, he completed his book, Gobin no Sho, Book of Five Rings, Circles or Scrolls. That is, it was only around the age of 60 that he reached the level of sage, sage philosopher or maturate, to feel the need to transfer the acquired knowledge. By him, uh, it was almost far, a two and a half, and see, it was one. The second one, Morife Uyashiba, trained from the age of 13, having learned the techniques and principles of Aiki Jujitsu Daitoryu, Jujitsu Kitoryu and Tenjin Shinyoryu, facing Kenjitsu and Yamijitsu, he created Aiki Budo and then Aikido, a new martial art and his own school. His age is 3.8, C equals 3. We have too little time to speak about all the masters. I hope the full text will be published and you could read about this hour, this my full article. You can see my direct master teacher, Grandmaster Lothar Zimmer, in this photo, the first from the left in Munich, in his Dojo School, Munich, Germany. Instructors below the country level don't create their own style, styles. Let us assume 20 highly titled masters for future uh, for further analysis. Is there a linear correlation between the versatility coefficient A and the creativity index C? Moderately strong correlation, moderately strong relationship, significant linear and positive relationship. As you see the, the parameters. And for discussion, the biographies indicate that they wandered a lot practicing various combat disciplines. Tokarski also writes about trainers with high levels of judo, karate, aikido and kendo. after how many years of training. In the case of Japanese karate, it is usually around 70 years of age and after over, uh, over 55 years of training. For example, Otsuka was 80 and 74 years of practicing Kubota 60 and 55, Masuda Tsuyama, and other. Although Fubu Tanaka was uh, licensed and became soccer of ancient Rukobudo at the age of only 32. And at the age of 46, he also had, he also had Eight done, and the title Hanshi. In Kobudo, Hatsumi, at the age of 41, he became soccer of the Togakure 
said you need it to score. You are just winner at the age of 35. Became Mento Kaiden Shikan of Tenchi Shoden Kakorichi Toryu, Kenji Tsu, and Kabudo School. In the table, you can see that General Choi Hong Hee was only 32 when he founded Taekwondo. Albert Flieger from Germany was 70 when founded his own style of karate. But Eric Rahm, that was a very talented person, was only 21 when founded his Jiu-Jitsu and Judo school in Berlin, in Germany. Characterizes a master or potential master of fighting arts. This is in particular, firstly, increased cognitive activity, second, increased practical activity, and at mastery at the best patterns of action, three, going to increasingly difficult tasks, four, showing creative inventiveness. Hisashi Nakamura established the Takedari Nakamura Art School where he teaches a, a team of disciplines as part of a complete Budo system. So Budo in Japanese. The most versatile masters like Meijin Mochizuki, Minhol or Meijin Ziber created interesting synthesis. The first of them, the development of classical techniques with counter techniques, i.e. Jiu-Jitsu. The second one, the development of real self-defense techniques based on Jiu-Jitsu and Karate. Other example is Grandmaster Daishi Kim. Dr. Daishi Kim was Grand Master of Hapti Doen Taekwondo Tenth Dan, also Judo Naik Dan and Jiu Jitsu Eight Dan, also Hardness and Softness, but without mastery in fencing and traditional weapons. He was academic teacher in USA and Korea and author of over 25 books. He promoted the martial arts, however, never created his own new style. Not all versatile master teacher needs to be a founder of new martial arts. Perhaps more important is to uh, teach right way, pathway of martial arts to be a better man. Also, moral and spiritual way. And for conclusions, versatility is a better understanding of the sense of, for example, Okinawa Kobudo, as in Ryushu's Sakagami, excellent in Kendo, as in Nakayama, teaching the complete system, as in Hisashi Nakamura, faster acquisition of skills and fuller practical knowledge and formally conformed competences in subsequent martial arts. A moderately strong relationship was found between the indicators versatility, indicator A, A and creativity, C. The wealth of knowledge and skills often translates into creating a new quality. This doesn't mean, however, that mastery in one of the Buddha varieties is no longer simply a mastery on the way of a warrior 
or also on the path of humanity. And versatility can, can even hinder the achievement of perfection in one specialized discipline. Perhaps versatility pays off only when HTD, the higher technical degree levels, or above are rigid in several natural arts. However, this requires further research. <coughs> the references, first part, second. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Schnauzki. Uh, our next presenter is Professor Paul Bowman of Cardiff University, United Kingdom. Uh, Professor Bowman is also co-editor of the journal Martial Arts Studies. He's, he also sent us his uh, recording of his presentation. Uh, his presentation is entitled How to Talk About Taekwondo. Taekwondo comes from Shotokan. 
Better than the retreat into ethnocentric denial, disavowal, and foreclosure would be to embrace the status as a post colonial martial art. And Taekwondo is very much a post colonial martial art. Its invention is political, of national importance during the process of reconstruction. But its origins are clearly marked by the Japanese martial arts imposed on Korean soldiers. It clearly did not make a simple leap from an older indigenous Taekyeon to modern Taekwondo. Of course, the Taekyeon origin narrative is understandable. Having an older indigenous art that could write Japan out of the narrative serves many functions. Post-colonial reinvention, identity reconstruction through an effectively effective historical narrative, what the philosopher Jacques Derrida called Poesis, the invention of a where we are from, which tells us where we are now, and hence where we are or should be going. But it's also the driver of ethno-nationalism, one which is understandable, but it is obsolete and should be abandoned. Because now, although originally the origin narrative sought to build a national identity, it's now an albatross around Taekwondo's neck. It actually makes scholars outside of the Japan and Korea chiasmus laugh. In a sense, this is a kind of laughing at Taekwondo. But really, the joke is on the continued efforts to prop up the origin myths. Better to abandon the myth once it's been busted, especially if it's served its purpose. The myth could have been jetsoned as soon as Taekwondo became an Olympic sport. In Olympic sports, all that matters is attainment, achievement, success. The company that invented the sport can be proud, can revel in cultural capital. And all that matters is who won last time and who will win this time. To configure Taekwondo as a sport is certainly one way to talk about Taekwondo. But it still does not seem to be the preferred way of South Korea. This is doubtless because the authorities feel that this misses something, or that Taekwondo or Korea misses out on something if it merely becomes called sport. This is doubtless why the Taekwondo one and the Kuki one and the other authorities market Taekwondo as being all things to all men, women, and children. Fun for children, supreme discipline for teens and young adults and even something akin to Tai Chi or yoga for all generations. The marketing and the packaging for Taekwondo in Korea wants it to be all things to all people. But this too can be seen through, and it is seen through, and does a disservice to Taekwondo. It is clearly marketing. It is clearly soft power. It is clearly a hegemonic project. For scholars to buy into any of it and repeat it uncritically and echolalaically is a disservice. So what would it be to do a service and not a disservice to take on top in terms of studying? My suggestion is simple. It is apparent to any with eyes to see that Taekwondo has always been intertwined with questions of Korean cultural identity. It's a key part of cultural soft power of Korea's domestic and foreign policy, and that is understandable, certainly. But where does it lead not only the scholar, but also the practitioner, when it comes to working out how to think and talk about Taekwondo in terms of the ontological question of what it is? Clearly, no one should buy into the myth when it is patently false, a simple untruth. Should scholars and practitioners be part of the machine selling the soft power? Clearly there are not only factual, but also ethical and political considerations of integrity here. As Adam D. Frank noted in his ethnographic study of Tai Chi Chuan, given the cultural status within modern China of practices like Qigong and Tai Chi, it would be inconceivable to propose a research project in China into Qigong or Tai Chi Chuan that did not in some sense start from the premise that Qigong and Tai Chi Chuan are definitely good for you. Posing the alternative question of whether they might be bad for you, for instance, is verboten. 
Similarly, as Luke Wacom once put it, on any given issue, there are often powers that want us to all to formulate the matter in the way that they want it to be formulated. So the key is to ask, how are issues surrounding a quantum formulated? Who is formulating like, them like that? Why not? Any scholar and researcher has to ask such questions. There are questions about the discourse and ideology of a given formation. There are preliminary questions about the discursive and ideological context. Establishing the contours of the ideology and discourse allows scholars to attain a critical purchase on the situation. It allows us to become alert, ethical and political issues surrounding our work, permeating our work perhaps. A different approach, which might appear less political, more abstractly philosophical, can also take us to the same place. In it, we just stop and try to think about how we think and talk about Taekwondo. What kinds of thoughts and questions about it are commonplace? What kinds are dominant? What kinds are mandatory or expected? The flip side then becomes the question, what kinds of scholarly thoughts and questions about Taekwondo are rare or marginal or deemed to be preposterous or forbidden? And then comes the question, why? Why are these approaches dominant and why are other ones rare? or non-existent in this field or in these borders. Even without knowing detailed histories, without naming names or pointing fingers, it is possible to grasp in an abstract, principled, philosophical sense that the way we conceptualize, formulate and engage with any object or practice has potentially profound ethical and political implications and ramifications. It determines what we think it is, what we are able to allow it to be. In the case of Taekwondo, the dominant formulations of what it is always urge us to conceptualize it in terms of being either a martial art or a combat sport or both. Sometimes, even on the other side of the world where I am, we hear other voices that ask us to think of it as an expression of Korean culture. This conference asks us to think about Taekwondo exclusively as a sport in relation to the Olympics. But I want to ask, are these familiar approaches really the primary, most fundamental, most important, accurate, or encompassing ways to think and talk about Taekwondo? The philosopher Hegel once noted that whatever is familiarly known is not properly known precisely because of its familiarity. Familiarity, he suggested, is the commonest form of self-deception. From here, my suggestion would be that one way we might do justice to Taekwondo would be for any and all kinds of scholars and students of Taekwondo to try to defamiliarize it in their thinking and their approaches. If we think Taekwondo is incredibly serious, what happens when, you, when we approach it as trivial and fun? If we think it's all about efficiency, what happens when we approach it as drama? If we think it builds ethical citizenship, what happens when we pose the question of narcissism, excess, spectacle, or selfishness? If we think it's philosophical, or ethical, or national, or ethnic, what happens when we consider the opposite? If we consider it as one thing, what happens when we think of it as less than one thing, more than one thing, incomplete, expanding, transforming, and so on? Don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that I'm the first person who's ever said this. There are wonderful scholars who take Taekwondo as their object and treat it in amazing ways. My friends Martin Minerick, Spencer Bennington, and others treat Taekwondo in incredibly creative ways. But I'm suggesting that whichever way you think and talk about Taekwondo, maybe you should also try to do the opposite. Taekwondo is deadly serious, is it? So what about fun, fantasy, play, creativity, 
Typhon was ancient, is it? So where does that lead invention, innovation, creative revolution within it? And Taekwondo is Korean, is it? In what ways can it be said to be so, to remain so today? And if it's global, international, a kind of gift to the world, why would it want to be so, need to be so? Or Taekwondo is about building peace, freedom, friendship, community and so on. But each of these ideas also have their dark sides. And their bright sides, of course. Taekwondo has many bright sides. I practiced it when I was younger. I loved it. And it was a delight. There is something indescribably delightful about high and fast kicks, about spinning and jumping, about thwacking the paddles. It's joyful, delightful, helpful, and so much more. And this is my point. Perhaps my own request, that before talking about Taekwondo, we take the time to talk, because we need to talk about how we talk about Taekwondo. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Song. I come from Kenya University, Department of Taekwondo. Today, I'd like to make a presentation about technical changes due to transformation of Taekwondo into a competitive sport. You know that Taekwondo technique has changed significantly over the last half century. In the 1960s, when Taekwondo was transformed into a competitive sport, the technique trend seemed to country. The purpose of this presentation is to explain the technical change of Taekwondo following the transformation of competitive sports in five aspects. You can read this one first, second, third, fourth, Fifth. Additionally, I would like to talk about the electric system and trend of Taekwondo technique. First, with the transformation of Taekwondo into a competitive sport, a taking shift from a focus on hand technique to high kick technique. You know that many people Talk about the traditional Korean dosmuye, you know the uh, dosmuye hand-to-hand martial art. I will explain the reason behind the Kondo trading into a martial art that focus on the key and making a simple comparison <coughs> with Korean traditional shion wrestling or taekyeon with Japanese snow or karate do. Uh, Korean martial art is much more post technique than Japanese martial art. From this aspect, the claim that Taekwondo become a martial art occurs in one footwork due to the influence of traditional Korean martial art seems to make sense. However, a bigger reason for Taekwondo developing into a martial art heavily dependent on foot techniques is that the Taekwondo instructor intentionally enacted a rule that encouraged kicking and especially high kick during the course of transforming Taekwondo into a combat sport or competitive sport. Second, 
traditional Asian martial arts was more reliant on techniques using the hand, even though kick are uh, about three times longer than hand, hand uh, strike, but they were comparably slow and lack of curious. Therefore, traditional Asian martial arts focused mostly on attack and defense technique using hand, either stationary or wrist while kicking technique was sometimes used for attacking, high kick especially, are uh, susceptible, susceptible of being caught, great, bad or not by the opponent. With the third revision of the competition rule in 1957, grabbing or holding the leg become an illegal move. Moreover, the rule amendment that you introduce higher score for kicking technique than punching technique. Moreover, high kick was encouraged or kick to the trunk. As a result of this decision, Taekwondo gradually transformed into a martial art focusing on kicking. Mm -hmm. anyway, Second feature of Taekwondo technique development was the shoot inspiring from a triple pattern of attack defense counter attack to a dual pattern of attack counter attack. In traditional Asian martial art, which is centered on the use of hand technique, the interaction inspiring is mostly comprised of the triple pattern of attack defense counter attack. This triple pattern structure has been accepted as the basic framework for sparring in Asian martial arts for a long time. However, we spoke ta taekwondo shifting to be more dependent on kicking technique. The triple interaction structure of attack defense counter attack was not effective any longer. One reason is that and the opponent continuously attacks the defender as difficult in reaction with a pattern of defense counterattack. In order to offset this structural flaw, Taekwondo Eslet developed direct counterattack skill, which omitted the second step, namely the defender block and counterattack directly. This skill and strategy developed in key technique of Taekwondo. Third, a method of kicking the opponent with the instead instead of ball of the foot and executing a roundout kick was introduced, which contributed also to an increase of kicking speed. In traditional Asian martial arts, most kicking techniques are executed with the sole or ball of the foot when striking. The attacker right is a bent leg, uh, threatening it with a snake motion and strike with the ball of the foot or other part of the sole, while the toe are bent backward. Noted this motion caused the calf muscle to stiffen due to slow down the kicking speed. Therefore, Taekwondo instructor divide kicking technique using the instep in order to make kicking faster. While executing a roundhouse kick with the instep, as led was able to strike much faster and in a biochemically more natural and relaxed posture. First, Taekwondo kicking technique transformed once again with the introduction of the attack from trunk protector. Earlier following the independent Korean from Japan 
was mainly carried out following non-contact rule, which the undertaker would stop the undertaker shortly before actually striking the opponent. However, after the introduction by the protector during the 1950s, poor contact firing became increasingly popular. This part of protector consists of filling with arms, converted by a strong fabric, which protected the body from strike by the opponent. However, this protector only absorbed loud impact, and there was instant in some fierce match, which a broken bamboo would protrude out of the clothes and injure in the computer. Very dangerous, yeah? Mm. First, the kind of kitchen. You know that? Uh, in order to solve this problem, dangerous, the danger, both protector with enter from first was introduced during the mid-1970s. This new protective gear brought about an effective change in the uh, taekwondo technique. The protector made out of bamboos and pebbles used in the fest did not produce only sound and kicking in with the foot. And therefore, the most important factor for computer was striking hard the powerful impact the opponent. However, the board control protector with alcohol resonated with a, a strong bang sound and kicked with the foot. Therefore, soon after, the bang sound became an indicator for point reward. As a result of this new scoring policy, a variety of new kicking techniques emerged, such as tongue and double kicks. Fifth, they want to introduce technique uh, using uh, turn force, which promoted the development of new technique such as turn key or tornado key. Turning the body to key was rare in traditional martial arts in Asia. Because doing so make the attacker vulnerable to counterattack. Moreover, the attack cannot see the opponent for a brief moment while turning. Therefore, the spinning battery or spinning hockey was also sometimes referred as a blind key. However, the acceleration of the rotation of turn key is performed by very uh, drastically, gaining great momentum and leaving the attacker less vulnerable to counter -tricks. And lastly, I was like talking about uh, PSS. Uh, additional change after introduction of the protector and scoring system. After the Kondo was selected as an official Olympic sport, competition became increasingly fierce and uh, this will frequently dispute over liquid coal to creating doubt over the fairness of taekwondo matches. The issue of fairness was an important factor which threatened the status of taekwondo as an official Olympic sport, which has to be addressed. Therefore, the World Taekwondo Federation newly introduced the electronic hall as protector. And then uh, instant video replay system to the uh, 2012 London Olympic to ensure objectively objectivity of judgment during the case. Subsequently in the 2016 New Olympic, the electric heavy gear was also introduced. The introduction of TSS protector scoring system and drastically reduced a dispute over the code, but it also resulted in a variety of change of taekwondo technique. I would like to talk about the uh, training point. 
after the introduction of the system, computer began people want to calculate the technique, which um, make but um, profit to be an easy way to on point. Since the electronic body protector and he had here seems to record the relatively weak strike, strong force, while kicking seems no longer a major factor in on point. Some even started to call on the sparring uh, first pension. Moreover, the introduction of PSS gave advantage to tall and bent athletes who appear less athletic, thin, low back and rich, uh, paramount in this new system. Lastly, the PSS record point in this community in fact. Therefore, a variety of non-conventional scoring technique emerges, which sometimes look comical and they certainly would not be recognized by human judges as uh, proper scoring techniques. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, we have a five presentation for session three, so I think we have another recorded presentation. We'll uh, watch the next presentation and take a short break and go to the final presentation by Dr. Johnson and uh, a roundtable discussion. So our next uh, presentation is by Dr. Martin Minarek, uh, who recently finished his studies at Institute of Human Movement Science at Harvard University, Germany. Dr. Minarek is also a co-founder of the Martial Arts for Peace .org, a non-governmental organization based in Germany and Turkey that implements martial arts as a vehicle for peace building and social cohesion. Uh, Dr. Minari's uh, presentation is entitled The Logic of Taekwondo Practice Toward a Praxis Oriented Understanding of Taekwondo's Ethics Beyond Tradition and Olympism. Ms. Martin Minari and I. Hello and welcome to our presentation. Thank you very much for your interest. My name is Martin Munari and I am currently about to finish my PhD at Hamburg University here in Germany at the Department for Human Movement Studies. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present my work at this year's conference and most of all, thank you very much for the organizing committee to make this conference possible despite of these difficult times that we have to face right now. The topic of our presentation is the logic of Taekwondo practice towards a practice-oriented understanding of Taekwondo's ethics beyond traditional organism. It deals with a possible understanding of Taekwondo's ethics, and by Taekwondo I refer to Taekwondo in its broadest possible definition. I am aware that many scholars and academics have already uh, contributed a lot to this uh, ongoing discourse on the ethics of Taekwondo, and I would like to contribute as well with a little bit of a different approach here, I think. So, the first question is, what is uh, Taekwondo's ethics? What am I talking about when I speak about Taekwondo's ethics? When I talk about Taekwondo's ethics, I speak about ethos or morals. I speak about norms, values, and ideals, which can be summed up under the term Taekwondo spirit, which most of you are surely uh, familiar with already. Taekwondo spirit has most often been associated with what is called traditional Taekwondo by practitioners and Taekwondo scholars alike, and this traditional Taekwondo is then often being described as traditional martial art with focus on self-development and self-defense. In contrast to that, modern sports taekwondo is often accused 
of lacking such kind of taekwondo spirit, while memory embodying modern sports ethics such as Olympic values. This, however, brings up two questions. Does having a specific discourse of ethics, such as a codes of conduct and moral doctrine, predetermine an actual practice? And does it mean that the lack of such moral doctrine means an actual lack of norms, those, and ideals after all? This approach tries to overcome the present dichotomy of traditional martial arts taekwondo and modern sports taekwondo regarding the embodiment of specific norms, values, and ideals, and it therefore asks how norms, values, and ideals can be analyzed in actual practice, regardless of the categorizations like those to mention before. Being a bodily intercorporal phenomenon in the first place, the actual practice of Taekwondo has to be at the center of study, even when you look at mental concepts such as ethics. The central question, therefore, is how can Taekwondo's embodied ethics can be analyzed based on the actual practice of Taekwondo itself, regardless of an elaborated, systematized, and verbally, verbally articulated ethic or moral code? In the course of this presentation, I will therefore give a brief, brief explanation of my research method, which I use in my PhD project to analyze the embodiment of Taekwondo spirit in the Taekwondo Dojang in Seoul. It combines ideas and concepts from both practice theory and performance theory, which both primarily focus on the bodily interaction of agents in relation to social and probably aesthetic structures. The basic assumption here is that all social life and cultural life essentially manifest themselves as praxis, which is then again defined by implicit knowledge, knowing how, rather than explicit forms of knowledge or knowing that, which are constantly checked and referred to in social action. According to this, discursive norms, values, and ideas exist and have an influence on everyday life and social behavior. However, everyday behavior is even more predetermined by implicit knowledge and routinized forms of behavior that have, that have more or less automatic Norms, values, and ideals are therefore to be found in praxis itself as implicit forms of knowledge. This also corresponds with Wittgenstein's approach to uh, implicit rules in spoken language, which he calls Redefolgen in German. Praxis can be defined as corporal interaction of human subjects, artifacts, and spaces, while practices or practice theory uh, put special emphasis on routinized bodily actions, which again can be conceptualized as social practices or social choreographies, as German sociologist and a scholar of dance studies, Gabriele Klein, uh, conceptualizes them. By analyzing those social choreographies, it is therefore possible to examine their underlying implicit knowledge or more precisely their implicit norms, values, and ideals which again form habitus on the social self of human subjects. Pierre Bourdieu describes habitus as form of individual self, which includes the knowledge of what is positive and what is negative social behavior, as well as what he calls social taste, for example, uh, what is beautiful and what is not. According to Pierre Bourdieu, habitus is learned through social practices in the first place. We can therefore assume that it's the implicit norms, values, and ideals which affect the individual habitus the most. However, all the social practices can be essentially described as routinized behavior. It doesn't mean that these practices are purely static in nature. In actual practice, those routinized practices concur with others and uh, unfold in different spaces with different participants which all have a specific habitus and not least a physical body with individual predispositions. This brings up to the concepts of performativity. Performativity goes back to the linguist John L. Austin and uh, he used the term performative to describe utterances which by expressing them perform a specific type of action. 
Most popular example is probably the act of marriage, which is conducted by the priest saying, hereby I pronounce you husband and wife. Philosopher Judith Butler then used the term to describe how social norms and values are implemented out or implemented in social interaction. They are performed and hereby perpetuated during each and every performance. However, this performance also brings the possibility for change. Using Dr. Rita's concept of iterability, she states that by repeating specific symbols or social practices, there is always a potential for changing the meaning of those symbols or practices by decontextualizing them, putting them in a different context, or simply by the individual background of the leader of those practices. Performativity therefore describes the contextual and situational unfolding of practices between repetition and innovation. After all this theory, how can this be applied on Taekwondo? How can Taekwondo and its norms, values and ideals as Taekwondo spirit can be conceptualized according to this paradigm? Firstly, it means Taekwondo is to be viewed as a praxis in the first place. That means to understand Taekwondo, one must look at actual praxis of Taekwondo. Of course, institutions, written texts and other discourses played an important role in the praxis of Taekwondo. However, the actual praxis is what, may, what makes Taekwondo what it is. This may include training praxis as an example, grading praxis, competition praxis, or demonstration praxis. To understand the norms, values, and ideals of Taekwondo, it is therefore necessary to look at those actual practices of Taekwondo and how norms, values, and ideals are implicitly embedded in, in those practices and social choreographies of Taekwondo. Also, Taekwondo praxis has to be viewed as being framed by routinized practices, which again underlie the contextual and situational fuzziness. Concurring practices, cultural and individual contexts and readings, as well as bodily factors, all play their part in the performative praxis of Taekwondo and potentially provide space for innovation, transformation, and change of meaning. After having contextualized Taekwondo as a performative praxis, how can the performance of norms, values, and ideals, in short, Taekwondo spirit, can be analyzed as a performative Taekwondo spirit? In my dissertation, I therefore relied on a method con for conceptualizing artistic performance developed, developed by German theater and performance theorist Erika Pischerlich. My approach here is to analyze the aesthetics and the dramaturgy of Taekwondo praxis towards its semantics or the meaning that is uh, or that can be interpreted in the course of analysis. Here I draw from a previous work where I conceptualized training praxis, competition praxis, and demonstration praxis as aesthetic performances with particip participating performers and spectators. Now we'll discuss uh, her performance concept, which she calls performative aesthetic in accordance with technical praxis. Spatiality. The question here might be, what is the space like? What is the place Taekwondo is trained in or practiced in? Or where does the competition take place or the performance? Um, how is the architecture of the place? How is the space decorated, for example? Um, also, how does the space predetermine the connection or separation of the participants? How does the space predetermine bodily actions? How are participants arranged in the space? Are they arranged in rows? Are they arranged in circles or lines? Um, these are possible, possible um, possible points for analysis uh, concerning the spatiality of Taekwondo practices. Corporeality, again, um, includes all bodily practices or bodily interactions. Um, for Taekwondo, this might be, for example, what kind of practices are predominant in the actual practices. Is it more um, is it more sparring type? Is it more 
Pusi or forms oriented? What, what specific types of uh, bodily interactions or bodily practices are incorporated in this actual practices? And not even even those, but what is the what is the bodily interaction between judges and competitors, for example, or coaches and judges, coaches and uh, and competitors. Um, also, it might be interesting to ask um, concerning the presence of the of the participants, what is skilled or what is perceived as skillful, what is perceived as beautiful. How are the participants dressed and how they are grouped or separated by their appearance? Does the instructor, for example, have a different outfit than, than the participants? Or are the participants themselves grouped uh, uh, into different um, categories by, by their um, bodily or by their uh, clothing appearance? What is probably the relationship between the phenomenal and the semiotic body of the of the participants? Um, what what are their body predispositions and how are these addressed or are, are, are not addressed? Probably, what is the 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 spirit of taekwondo that is that is being represented by bodily actions and their aesthetics? Tonality then includes uh, different aspects as speech, for example, and here speech means, um, of course, the semantics of, of what has been taught, but also how it has been taught, how it has been intonated, and is it yelled or is it, is, is it taught in a more, uh, in a more quiet and flowing way. Um, are there different other sounds maybe incorporated or um, uh, produced in the, in the course of actions like Pia, for example, the, the martial yell, and uh, how is this martial yell being executed? Is it um, more punctual or is it more um, stretch, fast stretch? Um, are there different kinds of Pia's used by different participants? Um, also, are there other types of um, sounds like, for example, the sound of the clothing, which, which uh, it makes when the technique is done um, very sharply or with uh, very much force or strength. Um, how are other types of sounds incorporated in the practice? For example, the cubit, which shows um, um, very beautifully uh, or very uh, exactly done technique by by this very um, clapping sound. Is music incorporated in the training? If yes, what type of music um, is incorporated in the training? All these aspects of tonality can be analyzed uh, aesthetically um, as um, meanings in technical practice. How is rhythm been, or how, what, what, what part does rhythm play um, in the practice? I mean, in movement or speech, how are bodies uh, brought up together as a, as a group with a, with a distinct rhythm, or are different um, parts of, of, of the practicing group practicing in different rhythms than others? For example, but rhythm also can apply to temporality in general, like the duration or the frequency of practice, how often is practice um, for for how long time, for example. All this also can be analyzed as uh, aspects of that. So all those aspects play a role in the creation of meaning. However, the creation of meaning must not only be viewed as one-dimensional process where the right meaning is either understood or not. In contrast, it has to be viewed as a multi-dimensional process where meaning is created in the process of performance on different levels. So how is meaning created in technical practice or praxis as performance? Fischer 
Fichte explains this process as emergence of meaning. The basis for the creation of meaning, however, is perception. So according to Erika fischer Lichter, when thinking about the emergence of meaning, two orders of perception have to be taken into consideration. The perceptual order of presence and the perceptual order of representation. So while the first means a pre-reflexive understanding of bodies in time and space, the second means the reflexive understanding of those while referring to discursive cultural knowledge defined by individual habitus. Meaning here emerges rather than it's communicated. In technical practice, this may refer to practitioners and instructors, officials and audiences. All those agents perform and perceive themselves and those technical skills constantly throughout the process of performance while interacting with each other and material and symbolic structures. So Taekwondo spirit as a performative Taekwondo spirit has therefore to be conceptualized and analyzed as an interplay of self-referential Taekwondo spirit and emergent Taekwondo spirit. The self-referential Taekwondo spirit encompasses meaning which is perceptive proof pre-reflexively, following aesthetics in the sense of a skillful positioning of the participants in space in relation to each other, is there any decoration in the space, is there any special clothing in general. The emergent technical spirit then encompasses reflexive interpretations of those artistic features in relation to pre-existing cultural knowledge and individual ex experiences. This can be very different depending on the participant's social and cultural background. Both modes of perception may not differently in the meaning-making process of each participating individual in each and every performative practice. So what does this finally mean for the initial question about specific norms, values and ideals of Taekwondo, or in short, the Taekwondo spirit? It can be concluded that the uh, Taekwondo spirit as performative Taekwondo spirit is performed and recreated in the actual intercorporal encounters of every single uh, training session, competition, demonstration and so forth, while centering around, around bodily routines. While the self-referential Taekwondo spirit may be viewed as a commonly perceived meaning to a certain degree for a specific group of participants, the emergent attack on the spirit is to be viewed as something less predictable. Common cultural discourses, narratives, and habitus may offer a certain predictability. However, the actual emergence of meaning is individualistic and not predictable in the first place. All in all, speaking of one single specific attack on the spirit might not be possible after all. It only can be analyzed for every single axis. What is commonly perceived as Taekwondo spirit, we may call institutionalized Taekwondo spirit, which can only be defined as one narrative among others, which flow into the emergence of performative Taekwondo spirit. Thank you very much, and I am um, looking forward for our discussions, and um, I hope to see you there.
Okay. Well, uh, one of the benefits of being on the organizing committee is that you can put yourself last, which means I can speak for as long as I want. So, uh, before anything else, I would like to say again, thank you to everyone. Uh, Professor Yoon, you're doing a fantastic job, and we just have to get through this part and we're done. So, <clears throat> my presentation today is entitled, Transcending Taekwondo Competition. Uh, this is a continuance of my work on Taekwondo and peace building, so I'm going to get to it. <clears throat> so by way of introduction, I would like to give a little bit of background information. Taekwondo has been used by North and South Korea for diplomatic purposes for decades. Apropos to the Korean political situation is the fact that the Taekwondo practiced inside the Korean Peninsula is just as divided as the two Koreas are today. Generally speaking, South Koreans practice a Taekwondo best identified as Guki or National Taekwondo, and competitions for Guki Taekwondo are overseen by World Taekwondo, or WT, and formerly known as World Taekwondo Federation. WT is the International Olympic Committee's uh, International Federation, or IF, for the Olympic sport of Taekwondo, but they also organize about a dozen other types of competitions every year or biannually around the world. In the North, however, the International Taekwondo Federation, or ITF, governs all aspects of that country's Taekwondo. It is imperative for us to understand, and I will come back to this point at, in my conclusions, that numerous ITF organizations exist today. The ITF headquartered in Vienna, but staffed by DPRK, or North Korean citizens, does not represent all ITF organizations and practitioners. In fact, there are three main organizations that use the ITF name, and almost two dozen other ITF organizations that follow the ITF curriculum that General Che uh, created. Now, today, WT and the ITF believe creating form and sparring competitions are the best way to continue Taekwondo diplomacy. Now, and getting to the theoretical background of my presentation, today I'm going to be using Galtung's Conflict Resolution Theory, or CRT. Uh, and Galtung promotes transcendence through CRT. He suggests transcending a conflict rather than defeating or conquering an adversary is the best way to build peace. CRT was used as the theoretical background of this study to further the emergent field of research on Taekwondo and peace studies, which does directly affect North and South Korean peace building efforts. <clears throat> So using CRT, this study aimed to find a means of joint competition between WT and ITF practitioners that, one, permits North and South Korean practitioners to participate in joint competitions, two, continues sport diplomacy efforts between the WT and ITF, and therefore North and South Korea, and three, allows Guki and ITF Taekwondo practice to remain intact, which is another point I will come back to in the conclusions. So, looking at my results, first I would like to talk about Taekwondo's cycle of conflict. The cycle of conflict is a central concept in the academic field of peace studies. Essentially, what it does is it states that conflict is procedural. And you can see we start with the source of conflict. This is the beginning of the uh, whatever problem a two or more parties are uh, arguing about or disagree about. 
And then we get to a trigger point, and this is where the conflict truly becomes problematic. And the two or more organizations or people, the parties in conflict, are actively trying, this is the point where they start actively trying to beat each other or win in the conflict. Escalation, as you can imagine, is when the conflict gets, uh, this is the point where the conflicting parties are trying to outdo one, one another, they're arguing, they're uh, attacking each other in some way or another. And then we get to deadlock. <clears throat> deadlock is when the two parties, or, or the conflicting parties, suddenly realize that their efforts are not working, that the conflict is either going to be continuous or they just become tired of the conflict. And that is when we begin the de-escalation de phase. And de-escalation is when the uh, conflicting parties start working together to create some type of peace or uh, to end the conflict in some way. And of course, termination means that the conflict ends. Now, what's important to understand here is that in order for termination to occur, the source, of, the source or sources of conflict have to be resolved by all parties involved in the conflict. Now, in a previous research, I correlated the cycle of conflict with the ITF and WT relationship. And that study, which was just published last week uh, by UNESCO, shows that the ITF and WT relationship or conflict uh, fits very squarely within this cycle of conflict and that termination has not yet been achieved. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into all of this detail. However, you can download the, the book um, that, it's print, that the study has been printed in and I will upload that to the IACT conference website, the, the link for that book there. So now let me get into Gautong CRT. CRT outlines a means to resolve conflict through empathy, nonviolence, and creativity so that all parties' interests receive equality and equity. He believes that this is, the, this is what is needed in order to move beyond the conflict and build a sustainable peace. So CRT focuses the conflicting parties on the mutually beneficial goal of a sustainable peace. And what this means is that he, the peace builder, or negotiator if you like, but the peace builder comes in and takes the goals of the conflicting parties, in other words, to win, and changes that into the goal of building a sustainable peace. Rather than stopping a conflict with force, CRT addresses conflicts in a manner that respects each party's views, needs, and intentions. To do so, we must transcend the conflict instead of one side dominating the other. So Gautong states there are five possible outcomes to any conflict. Uh, there could be two victories, one withdrawal, one compromise, and if you're still awake and still with me, you know where I'm heading, and that is one possible transcendence. So let me discuss how all of this correlates and uh, comes together within the Taekwondo discussion. There are five possible outcomes for the WT-ITF conflict. The first is a WT victory. WT dominates and the ITF capitulates. And <clears throat> that would result in a WT dominated style competition. Victory number two, and I think we could all agree that this is the least likely of the five, is that the ITF dominates the peace building process and the WT capitulates resulting in an ITF-dominated 
a competition or an ITF victory. Of course, this is highly unlikely because World Taekwondo has way too much, uh, not way too much, uh, way more political and financial power than the ITF in Vienna. So that takes me to number three, and number three is the withdrawal. And withdrawal is where WT and ITF walk away, and the conflict basically continues without any actual uh, sustained conflict or the two parties trying to beat each other. And uh, the unification of competition rules are just postponed. Now, that takes us to number four, the compromise. And compromise, normally we like to think of compromise as something good. I give a little, you take a little, vice versa. But all too often, there's a problem with compromise in that one party has too much power or too much, uh, they're, un they're able to control the, the negotiation in their favor in some way that the source of conflict is not actually resolved. So, in a compromise, often, and we can see this in the ITF, the ITF and or WT would concede too much, therefore the source of conflict is not fully addressed to all parties' satisfaction. That takes us to number five. Number five is the transcendence. Now, Taekwondo competition, in this situation, Taekwondo competition would be re-examined outside of the current ITF-WT relationship and framework and mindset to find a, an imaginative solution in which both organizations and their practitioners are satisfied. And essentially, that means building a brand new relationship. So, the obvious question then is, what would a WT ITF transcendent competition look like? Now, before I answer my or give you my answer to that question, I would like to preface it with the fact that I'm not talking about reimagining the current ITF or WT competition system. What is been proposed is that a a separate competition just between WT and ITF competitors be allowed for the purposes of Taekwondo diplomacy, which would, would therefore take cultural uh, Taekwondo cultural diplomacy into the realm of sport diplomacy, where two teams are actively trying to win in a competition. So. My suggestion, and this is my suggestion, this is an idea that I believe would work, but honestly, what needs to happen is that a peace builder sit down with the ITF and WT and guide them. <clears throat> so this could just be a starting point, a suggestion for them to build upon. But in my paper, I argue that a, to adapt and adopt an MMA uh, slash boxing 10-point must system uh, type of competition would work for the Kyurugi or Matsugi sparring style of competition. And take a US style open form or Pumse Tu competition model for uh, taekwondo form competition. Now, unfortunately, I know we are running late and I don't have enough time to expound upon this, but the, the study has been published. Uh, please feel free to contact me or talk to me about it during our panel discussion. But I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave it right here for now. And just get straight into my conclusions. So, for a sustainable piece, it would be, I, I do argue and I do personally believe that it would be in the best interest of World Taekwondo and the ITF Vienna to adopt Gautong CRT for their negotiation framework. It is a proven peace building method. 
Uh, CRT may also offer new perspectives previously unconsidered by these two Korean organizations. Regular WT ITF competitions would offer opportunities for the two Korean organizations to meet and create a new culture, which is what Yao Tong uh, advocated. And more importantly, to us as individual Taekwondo practitioners, the, the MMA boxing style competition, the open form competition that I suggest in my paper, would not create change uh, in the styles of competition. And as Dr. Kapener and Dr. Mornick have shown over the years in their research, Anytime you mess with the, or the Taekwondo competition rules, then you play with how Taekwondo is practiced. So this, I don't believe that there are many Taekwondo practitioners in the world that are willing to give up their decades of practice and do something new and different for political reasons. Instead, I think they want to keep what they're doing. And in the models that I suggest, they would be able to maintain their individual practice, to keep their identities, and if for lack of better explanation, keep their individual Taekwondo's pure. As much as a Taekwondo style can be pure. So, wrapping up, I'd like to give us some warnings. <clears throat> and now I get to go back to what I mentioned in the introduction. WT only engages with the ITF in Vienna. So what that means is that not all of the parties involved in the conflict are part of the peace building process between the WT and ITF. Now, there are some advantages to this. <clears throat> Excuse me. The number one, of course, is that it's much easier to deal with one organization than 20-some ITF organizations that may have different views. Uh, but again, if we go back to that the source, the cycle of conflict model, you may resolve the sources of conflict between WT and the ITF in Vienna but you've got many other organizations that may have their own separate sources of conflict that are not being addressed, which means that the ITF-WT conflict would continue even if WT Vienna and W and the or sorry the ITF in Vienna and WT find a sustainable peace. Maybe more importantly is that there is a danger with sport diplomacy. By having the WT and ITF Vienna competitors face each other in direct competition, it creates a hazardous situation. Sports can uphold and intensify existing grievances. We see this almost every four years in the Olympics, whether it's the US playing the USSR in ice hockey, or a possible future ROK and DPRK competition we can actually see that, or we can foresee that Taekwondo could be used not to build peace, but to intensify the differences between the two uh, Koreas. So serious attention must be given to the likelihood that rivalries between the two countries could be played out through Taekwondo. Considering this, my final conclusion is that joint competition or joint taekwondo competitions must tread carefully, if at all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Um, now we go right to the panel discussion. Uh, we have all four presenters from Europe online. I believe so. Okay. Okay, we are running a little late, uh, but I think we still have a time for our presenters to 
give at least one com for the comment or raise questions. So I'd like to turn to Professor Saski first. Uh, if he has any further comments or give me a second. Please. Okay. Let me begin the session with an open question to our panelists. Uh, and uh, this again comes from Master Castillo in the United States. He asks, is the title Sabum the highest honorific we can give in Taekwondo? And does Kwanjong, uh, does the title Kwanjong is the title Kwanjung overinflated? Uh, should we strive actually for a Sabong always? And Kwanjung when administration is needed and arises. So, Dr. Lewis, um, I know your work has focused a lot on the etymology and use of Korean terminology. We'll start with you if you don't mind. Yes, but my work is related to ITF Taekwondo only because in ITF Taekwondo there are different terms um, some of you meaning coach or um, an instruct instructor to be modeled and then there are two other terms which in English are master and grandmaster but more likely a moral instructor and a philosophical or sage-like instructor for master and grandmaster so in ITF there are terms and the term Guanjang is not really used within the ITF system. Whereas in the WT system there seems to be just these two terms, Sabomin and the system instructor who's Sabomin and um, Guanjangmin which Guanjang literally refers to the owner of the jump. Um, uh, uh, one. <laughs> Guan is the house, so the owner of the Guan, um, which it's now used as mentioned as an administrative function. So somebody that owns the school, the Dojang, can be called the, the Guanjang. And it's a term that's used outside of the martial arts in other places where somebody owns something. Um, so the question is, should there be other terms? And I think that that is a question that should be asked to the Googie one and WT. In WT that has a sports focus, I don't think there's a need for another term because the term subordinate effectively works as coach. And sometimes they would even replace subordinate with coach, coachy as a as an alternative. Um, but within the Kugi one that still promotes a sense of, how can I say, traditional Taekwondo, um, they might need to consider alternative terms. Professor Kapenner, would you, is there anything you would like to add to that? Oh. The, uh, Professor Lewis is absolutely right. Guan here is the Guan in Chiu Guan, which is gymnasium. So in South Korea, they stopped using the word Bojang in one time. And it's Chiu Guan, which is, it, that's used for all kinds of sport, you know, training halls. Um, so Guan Zhang, Zhang just means the head of something, right? So that is, that is used in, um, you know, wrestling, schools or boxing schools. Uh, but um, there is another term that Koreans use, sabunin, uh, which means bu is actually jiabi bu in Chinese, which means a father figure or the, uh, a respected male elder figure. But I mean, in a poetic sense, in a lot of Korean and Chinese, Chinese character-derived expressions are quite poetic. It means teaching father, and that's the term I use for Koreans that I've learned from that I really respect. And it's, 사범 
is not related, is not limited only to, to Taekwondo. Sabom means teacher. And so in a lot of schools, you'll have a Sabom a teacher's college. That's literally a school of education. So that term also has sort of been, I think, appropriated for martial arts. But Sabon, um, which in Chinese would be Sifu, right? That term is also used. So it's a little bit of Korean language for the international language. I do have one question for uh, Professor Bowman. Uh, this was asked by Professor Dumzinka. Uh, rather than read it, uh, I asked in the chat for Professor Dumzinka to ask it himself. I think we are technically able to do that. If you could ask the question in a abbreviated way, because we are quickly running out of time. Well, uh, whenever we practice Taekwondo, uh, uh, the longer we practice, never we practice. We practice for different reasons. Uh, so, Dr. Uh, Bolton was talking about how to define, how to talk about Taekwondo. Uh, but Taekwondo doesn't have to be something that is defined by your, like Taekwondo to us. We all always will have our own definitions every time we practice. We'll have our own understanding of Taekwondo every time we practice. Um, Dr. Manarek, concerning what he said about the aspects of performing Taekwondo, um, uh, we all do that. We all, uh, in our performance of Taekwondo, we've all done many things that Dr. Manarek talked about. So we create meaning of our own self-referential Taekwondo enactments every time we practice. So Taekwondo can be everything, uh, but it just doesn't have to be everything for everybody. It is. Uh, in reality, something different to everyone every day. So who cares if we practice Taekwondo as a martial art one day, we practice it as a self-defense another day, we practice it as a foundation another day, maybe at the same time we practice it as an ADHD control device, as concentration, as focus. Who cares? Um, the longer we practice, it's going to be something different to us anyways every day. Uh, Dr. McCormick and Dr. Willard, how would you respond to what I just said compared to, uh, in relation to what you guys? Yeah, I'll go first if that's okay, Martin. Um, yeah, thank you very much. It's a very interesting question. I think that, um, I mean, if I want to take acid or ecstasy or heroin, it could mean something different to me every day, but it exists as, as a social fact. And it has it has as a certain kind of cultural status. Depending, I mean, if I want to smoke weed every day, I can claim that it, it's for spiritual reasons or whatever. But if but if I'm in, but I also have to take into consideration the, the, the legal and and, and ethical uh, context and the cultural values around that. So I'm interested. I'm interested in. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. I, I practice martial arts, and they're different to me every session. I also agree very much with Martin about the, the way in which the, the, the meaning is constructed in every kind of praxis and every, however you define that, every habitus. And I was very interested in the, in the presentation by Dr. Song, which was the first, uh, which was, which was uh, I think, just after me, um, in which, or possibly just before, in which I uh, talked about the way in which different technological innovations effectively change the practice of something. But what I want to add is the dimension that um, relates to the external context of a practice, the way in which, the way that we think about, the way that is presented, the way that is constructed, uh, in, in terms of the institutions around it, can effectively determine um, what a practice is. Um, and there's a politics to that, and there's an ethics to that. And I wanted to just speak to scholars and ask scholars to, to kind of, to, to, to estrange themselves, rather than to adopt an easy, comfortable discourse. I want to, I want to, just to encourage scholars to take critical dis, to take critical distance from the terms that they are expected to use. So I wanted to broaden the frame from the internal features or the material um, material factors to also take into consideration the larger kind of um, national and institutional factors around the practice.
Okay. Um, actually, all know that we are running a little late, but I, st I still would like to give uh, our presenters uh, our chance to add or comment on. So let's turn to Professor Sinanski. Uh, if you have anything to uh, add on your presentation or have a comment on other presentations. Firstly, uh, to uh, to uh, thank you uh, to to uh, give my uh, thanks for for uh, for the invitation uh, invitation uh, me uh, and the opportunity to take part in this uh, very uh, important and interesting scientific event. Uh, greetings from. Poland and from IMAX, the International Martial Arts and Combat Sports Scientific Society, to all participants and my congratulations for, for uh, organizers, uh, also for you. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, I, I like uh, the, this uh, event, this conference. Uh, it, it is uh, I'm sure very important, and and uh, I think uh, we we should cooperate in, in such uh, research of, of uh, in area of combat sports and and martial arts uh, for taekwondo and and uh, in the context of, of other uh, styles of, of fighting arts. Uh, when someone. Uh, would like to, to ask me uh, uh, about uh, pro problems uh, of, of my presentation, I, I can uh, try to, to, to answer for, for more questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd uh, like to next turn to uh, Dr. Minarik, if you would you like to mm -hmm. add anything to our discussion? Yeah. Dr. Minarik? Dr. Minarik, we cannot hear you, sir. Oh, okay, <laughs> now we can hear you. So I would like to reply to Dr. Uh, Jivenka about um, the problem of what the uh, technology is and uh, of course there are these two, um, maybe two aspects that we could talk about. So what technology is in an ontological sense and uh, you would say technology is really actually in the, in the practices itself. So of course this is somehow uh, um, this, this can be conceptualized um, situational to a certain degree, but also there is this kind of structure because um, uh, practices are are, uh, re, um, are, are practiced uh, uh, in, in, in a very uh, same way in, in many settings. So this is one thing, and um, about the meaning, so this is highly, highly so uh, these are the two things that you have to talk about. And, um, what I would like to say to Dr. Lewis, I'm very sorry that I couldn't um, hear his uh, presentation today, but uh, after reading his uh, abstract of his presentation, I think that we might speak of very, um, very same things uh, when, when he speaks about the, uh, the Imaginatory, I think, and the symbolic and the real, these are um, maybe uh, to a certain degree 
some kind of analogies what I'm uh, speaking about when I am um, talking about the practices and the emerging technological spirit in the self, the referential technological spirit, I think um, uh, here might be some, um, some, some common points and um, maybe we can talk about that in the, in the, in the course. So that's it from my point. If uh, somebody has any um, questions to me, I'm happy to answer that. Thank you very much. Uh, before we turn to Dr. Johnson for closing remarks, maybe just one more question from anybody who are present here? Yes, Oh, okay. Dr. Moni. <coughs> Martin, I think we recorded this whole uh, conference and we'll, we will post it uh, on the internet so uh, probably you can watch uh, uh, Sanko's presentation later on there, okay? Um, re related to Dr. Bowman's presentation and uh, Dr. Dejinka's response that um, what he said about trying to make Taekwondo everything to everybody, that's exactly what is happening now with World Taekwondo. Uh, as the popularity of the sport plummets because of the rule changes and the fact that it's, um, it's so fundamentally different than the sport that evolved uh, out of karate into this, the Olympic sport of the 80s and 90s, uh, lowest viewer ratings for the London Olympics, for instance, somebody wants to watch it. The WT's response, instead of trying to really fundamentally fix what it is they do, which is sport taekwondo, they're adding different um, performative uh, options to the toolbar. Um, more and varied demonstrations, beach games where you do pungse in your underwear or in a bathing suit, um, K-pop style uh, taekwondo performances. If you if you go to taekwondo departments at Korean universities, um, you'll notice that kids are coming to taekwondo now because there's a chance that they can actually break into K-pop and, and YouTubing through taekwondo because they, they literally spend uh, whole semesters practicing dance routines with a few token taekwondo moves put in. So what it what's become what what we've got is we've got this Swiss Army knife. And yeah, like Ron said, if I want to if I need a corkscrew to open my wine, I have that. I can flip it out and opening wine today, or I can file on my fingernails, or I can you know cut a cuticle off my finger with the little scissors, but really what a knife is, is, is it's a blade. And um, it becomes more and more difficult to talk about what Taekwondo is, the more uh, options we add to the knife. Um, so I, I think where maybe Dr. Dejenga and Dr. Bowman sort of missed each other, where maybe Dr. Dejenga missed Dr. Bowman is you can your, your motives for doing it can be different on any given day, but there has to be some fundamental understanding of what the core content of, of it is. Um, and I don't think the dilution of that is the answer, or is going to make this discussion any easier. So, thank you. Yes, I thought uh, Dr. Chaney that the recorder should be uh, imposed on all, uh, all kinds of Swiss Army knife options for us. I just, I'm speaking from the individual's perspective. Taekwondo is something different than me. Um, yes, uh, as Dr. Minar said, uh, there should be some fundamental aspects that, that, that should be, um, uh, that we should keep in mind. But uh, the longer I practice, the more things I can take out of my practice. So again, I'm speaking from the individual's perspective, not from organizational perspective. Thank you. Uh, I think we better start wrapping up, but 
Before that, uh, we now turn to Dr. Johnson, uh, Vice President of IAC, which is also co-sponsoring today's conference for closing remarks. Dr. Johnson. Thank you, sir. So, the this conference today, there have been too many topics to review. So, I would like to end this conference on a more of a personal note. Uh, when I was a PhD student and beginning the PhD studies, I realized that the discussion of Taekwondo academically had been pretty much dominated by Korean uh, researchers and had been focused on WT or Kuki style Taekwondo. And I was a little bit personally saddened, saddened that the discussion was excluding the ITF and General Che Hong Hee. Uh, one of the purposes of IACT was to bring out the voices in the Taekwondo that were not typically being heard. And the fact that nearly every single presenter today mentioned the ITF or its role in Taekwondo development or lack thereof um, is testament that IACT is reaching and uh, achieving the, the goals of creating a more balanced discussion about Taekwondo. The mark of a good conference is that it pushes the discussion further. And today, I believe that we can say, not only has my dream been realized, uh, but that Taekwondo has grown academically because of what we have discussed here today. Uh, as a Taekwondo researcher, I could not be prouder to have been a part of this conference. I couldn't be prouder of IACT. I couldn't be prouder to be here today at Yongsan University. And again, I, I greatly appreciate Dr. Morning and the other organizers of here at this university to allow this conference to happen. So thank you again to everyone, and I believe that's the end. Uh, with uh, and our new uh, head of department, Che Hyun Min, you would say something? Yes, sir. Uh, people, people are watching these kind of conferences, and I, I thought like that is a, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Taekwondo is for uh, only Korean people. Korean is a player, Korean is a, for uh, some officer like that. But it's, um, I got changed my mind today. Is that in the world, the 20 the Taekwondo practice and so 20 researcher is a uh, think about uh, Taekwondo for development. So I'm very proud of, of why I'm here. So. Thank you for coming to Professor Old Professor and I hope next time is will see you again. Thank you. Well, it's been a long day, but it has been very, at least for me, it was very interesting and enlightening. Uh, I didn't know about Taekwondo watch, but uh, so I think that pretty much uh, wraps up today's conference and it just remains for me to say that uh, today's conference is uh, now concluded. Uh, thank you very much for all the uh, presenters who also who are here and also joined us uh, online and also many uh, others who followed us uh, during the day on YouTube. Thank you very much. Uh, everybody keep healthy in this time of pandemic and hopefully next year uh, I look forward to next International Taekwondo Conference where everybody will be healthy, everybody will uh, be in person. Uh, well, good evening or good morning or <laughs> uh, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, and I announce that uh, today's conference is now concluded. Thank you.